Welcome to Star Wars Comics and Canon. The Force is strong with this one. Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 70. So then guys, this week I am tackling the third volume of Darth Vader comics from 2017, written by Charles Saul. Before I get into that information just quick, if this is your first time with the show, I go through the plot points, just giving sort of a general idea of what happens with the plot. So there are going to be spoilers if you're intending on reading this, but I don't read out absolutely everything. So if you want to read this afterwards, there's still plenty for you to read. But as I go through, I talk about the many connections to other Star Wars content in the canon, as well as a little bit of trivia here and there and some other bits and pieces that I may find interesting. And I want to note that although this is the third volume of Darth Vader comics, it works perfectly as its own story. The only recommendations are that you've seen Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, and Episode 4, New Hope. If you've seen those two movies, which I would be incredibly surprised if you're listening to this and haven't seen those two movies, then you're going to be completely fine. It is also worth noting that this comic, because it was released around the same time, has incredibly heavy links to the main run of Star Wars comics from 2015, specifically issues 44 to 49, which is the eighth volume of Star Wars comics, and it's called The Mutiny on Mon Cala. I tackle these in episode 48 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, so if you haven't read them, go back and listen to that episode and I'll give you all the information you need. But just to clarify, this Darth Vader run is happening about a year after Revenge of the Sith, at 18 years before the Battle of Yavin, which which is A New Hope, and the Star Wars comics I just mentioned happen between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. But it's a really, really rewarding read if you've read both of the comics, because when they were coming out and getting released monthly, you'd read them and something would happen in this comic, and then you'd see the repercussions of that nearly 20 years later in the main run of Star Wars comics. I won't specifically say what that is, but I just thought I'd flag that up with you guys. So before getting into the story, let's get into the comic information. So as I said, it was the third volume of Darth Vader comics from 2017. So this actually includes issues 13 all the way to issues 18. And the trade paperback collection includes the Darth Vader annual number two, which I will be tackling in this episode as well. So issue 13 of the Darth Vader comics came out March 2018. The annual number two and also issue number 18 both came out July 2018. The trade paperback collection with all of these came out September 2018. The hardcover volume two collection, which has all of these comics and then the final eight comics from the Darth Vader run, which I'll be tackling in an episode in a few weeks time. That came out August 2020. And then the full 2017 Darth Vader omnibus, which is going to include all the issues as well as the annual number two is due to come out October 2021. So for the Darth Vader run of comics, the writer is Charles Saul, the penciler is Giuseppe Camancoli, the inker is Danielle Orlandini, the colour artists are David Curiel for issues 13, 14, 15, 17 and 18, but for issue number 16, Java Tartaglia and Guru EFX are actually the colour artists. Oddly enough as well, when I mentioned that Giuseppe is the penciler and Danielle is the inker, in the physical versions that is what it is listed as, but in the digital versions it actually states that Giuseppe came and Curly did the layouts and Danielle Orlandini did the finishes, which is quite interesting. I haven't seen that before, so that might be the case for other versions because normally I read the physical versions of the copies and then when I do this podcast I use Marvel Unlimited to go through the digital versions just because it's easier to scroll through and doesn't make noise, but it's the first time I've noticed something like that, so... Yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, Annual Number 2 is written by Chuck Wendig, who has actually done the Aftermath trilogy of books, which I really recommend to people. The penciler for the Annual Number 2 is Leonard Kirk. The inkers are Walden Wong and Scott Hanna, and the colour artist is Nolan Woodard. But I'll be tackling Annual Number 2 right at the very end, so after I've finished with issue number 18, so I'll probably remind you guys of those personnel. So as I said a moment ago, these comics take place about a year after Revenge of the Sith, so at 18 years before the Battle of Yavin. Now, interestingly enough, in the printed versions, it actually says it happened around three years after Revenge of the Sith. So when we had the first two volumes of the Darth Vader run, that was within the first year or so after Revenge of the Sith. Then this was supposedly taking place about two years after that. However, due to other canon content and things that kind of contradicted certain elements of it, 
In the digital versions now, they've actually amended it to say it's only one year after those other comics as well. So when I first read these, I was thinking, oh, these are, you know, a couple years after the last ones. And I read them and it was like only a year after. And I was like, I didn't think that was true. I thought it was a few years. I was certain of it. And then I, I took a look and yeah, it turns out that for the digital versions, they've amended it, some of the dialogue and whatnot. So quite interesting in that regard. So if anyone is paying attention and they think that I've got that wrong, they've amended it, uh, which is interesting. And there's a couple of moments in this that we'll link back to that somewhat that I'll probably flag up um, but I just wanted to mention that to you guys in case anyone has got the physical versions who's reading along because I know a bunch of you do and your versions say something different that is why so with all that background information let's get on to the crawl of issue number 13 some time has passed since the ascension of Emperor Palpatine, the formation of his great galactic empire, and the descent of former Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker into his new form as twisted half-man, half-machine Darth Vader, Sith apprentice to Palpatine. Vader and his squad of evil force-wielding hunters, the Inquisitors, have had great success seeking out the few survivors of the Purge that destroyed the noble Jedi Order just prior to Palpatine's rise. Few Jedi remain in the galaxy. But now, a new threat has arisen to the Emperor's still new, still vulnerable regime, and Vader must confront both his past and his present. So issue 13 starts with a flashback to the Revenge of the Sith battle between Obi-Wan and Anakin on Mustafar. Except it's not Anakin, it's... Darth Vader in his black suit and Obi-Wan yells it's over Anakin I have the high ground and then Darth Vader uses the force to throw love on Obi-Wan and as Obi-Wan tries to sort of jump in the air Vader then slams him on the floor and then he sets on fire and is dying saying you're my brother Anakin I loved you and it's quite an interesting sort of maybe not alternate timeline because obviously if that had happened then Vader wouldn't be in the suit he's in but it's quite interesting seeing that sort of thing I quite like that and obviously at the moment of recording this Marvel's What If is going on that's really cool I do recommend it to people who haven't checked that out yet and there's a lot of buzz and rumours and things that people are talking about the Star Wars What If like if that's ever going to happen and I think as a Star Wars fan that's something that we all would love to see um, but anyway getting sidetracked by the What If if there is even going to be a What If um, the next page then shows that it was Vader in his meditation chamber he talks to Palpatine and it's been confirmed that it's one year since the rise of the Empire, but the Mon Cala people are being defiant, and Palpatine suspects that a Jedi may be involved. So he's confirmed that Tarkin will be the strategist, and Vader will go along and find the Jedi. It shows that Tarkin is on his Star Destroyer called the Sovereign, and he discusses an action plan with some Imperial officers. Now the Star Destroyer, the Sovereign, you can actually see it in Star Wars Rebels, that's where you first saw it. The Sovereign is Tarkin's own Star Destroyer, or he commands it, and you actually first get to see it in Star Wars Rebels. Now information about Tarkin, you get a lot of that information in episode 43 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, uh, because when I tackled the Age of Rebellion villain one-shot comics, which I believe are written by Greg Pak, it has a Tarkin story in there as well as a Vader story and a couple other things. So I do recommend you guys go and check that out if you want more information on Tarkin. But for clarity, his name is Wilhuff Tarkin. His name is not Grand Moff, which is a misconception. Grand Moff is actually a title which he does not hold in these comics as of yet. He gets that, I believe, in the book Tarkin, which is after this. And... Tarkin is from the planet Eredu, E-R-I-A-D-U. At his death on the Death Star, he is 64 years old, so around here he's approximately 46 years old, and he is Governor Tarkin. But I want to also add here that although I mentioned about the Grand Moff thing in the Tarkin book, I'm fairly sure that in the Bad Batch series, he is called Grand Moff once or twice. So when he got the title of Grand Moff is a little bit contentious in the canon. I think it's just certain writers think, you know, it's one time, others think it's another. I don't think it's really relevant or makes much difference. Tarkin has always had power. You know, when he was in the Republic, he had a fair amount of influence. But once the Empire came up, he was, you know, one of the number one advisors to Palpatine, as well as being his like strategist and military leaders and things. So he's just high up, whether or not he's the governor or specifically the Grand Moff or whatever. For me, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. But I just want to clarify that in case people are reading or consuming content around this time period at Tarkin and see he's named different things. It's just a mistake if we're being blunt. Anyway, at Mon Cala, it is confirmed that due to Mon Cala's deep water, the Empire will actually need special equipment to be able to get them, because the water acts like its own natural shield. Now, Mon Cala is a water world, so there's not that much stuff above land. There's like a few islands here and there and some cities and whatnot, um, which aren't that dissimilar to how the cities on Camino look. But you get to see Mon Cala, I think for the first time in canon, in the Clone Wars Series 4 premiere. It's a three-episode arc, and you've got Anakin and Padme and Ahsoka go down there. I 
think Obi-Wan goes with them as well. Kit Fisto's there too. And it's a civil war between the Quarren and the Mon Calamari. The Mon Calamari are the same species as Admiral Akbar. So in the realm of Star Wars, to sound racist, they look like goldfish people, while the Quarren look more like squid people. They have more sort of triangular shapes. They have tentacles coming out of their faces. But there's a civil war between the two of them because they both exist on the same planet. Now, three famous Mon Calamari are Gael Akbar, who's Admiral Akbar, King Lee Char, who is very prominent in the Clone Wars episodes that I just mentioned, and then also Admiral Radis. Now, Radis is in Rogue One. You get to see him at the Battle of Scarif, and also the ship that Holdo flies in The Last Jedi and does that Holdo maneuver where you know she goes light speed and then it hits the ship and shatters and destroys a lot of the First Order. That ship is called the Radis as well, as it's a homage to Radis. And I'll get more into the information about that ship a bit later on, because I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the ships the Mon Calamari have, but we'll tackle that a little bit later. So back on Tarkin's Star Destroyer, he's talking with these Imperial officers about how they're going to target Mon Cala, and he mentions about propaganda. He says if they use the right propaganda, it could cause a civil war, because the Empire needs to control the Mon Cala people, not destroy them without cause. While this is happening, an Imperial ambassador negotiates with King Li Char. The Imperials want some materials and they demand it at essentially any quantity at all for a fraction of their worth, and Li Char is not happy about that. After a bit of back and forth, the ambassador eventually leaves, and then Radis is there speaking with Li Char. Radis wants to secede from the Empire, but Li Char is still unsure what it would do to the implications of the galaxy as a whole. And Radis also mentions the mysterious secret advisor. As this is happening, an Inquisitor's shuttle lands on Mon Cala, and some people are shown, so I'm going to give you guys information on some of the Inquisitors. So one of them is the Ninth Sister, who is a Dewatin, who is a big, hulking creature. Um, you probably recognize them from, there's the video game, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, and you actually fight the Ninth Sister in that. Um, but also in The Force Awakens, this is the example I always give, in The Force Awakens in Maz Kanata's castle, when you see BB-8 there, and you see the good droid notify the resistance and then the woman wearing a lot of black notify the first order the woman wearing a lot of black and stuff she is sat on like a sofa thing with this big hulking creature and that is a Dewatin. and Dewatins actually live for a few hundred years and in fact in the high republic novels so the ones i've been reading alongside which i've done book reviews for two of them so far i've read four in total i just finished the rising storm the other day there is a character called pan ieta and it's part of the Nile, that is also a Dowatin as well. So yeah, really big hulking creatures and things. So that's the ninth sister. Then you've also got the sixth brother, who is actually the antagonist in the Ahsoka novel by E.K. Johnston, which is a good novel, I uh, recommend it. And then there's also the tenth brother, who is actually a character called Proset Dibs. He has no eyes because he is a Mira Luca. Now, you may remember the name Proset Dibs because he actually shows up as a Jedi in the Mace Windu comics. So I tackled that in episode 16 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. It's a mini series about just some Clone Wars era battle right near the start of the Clone Wars that Mace Windu was involved with and he goes off with Kit Fisto. And Proset Dibs at the time is a Jedi, but by the end of the story, Proset Dibs is disillusioned with how the Jedi are handling things and he actually fights Mace Windu. And then I believe at the end of it, he basically gets put into essentially Jedi prison and obviously when the Empire reigned, Palpatine, what he did, he wanted a lot of Inquisitors and people to support his regime that were Force-sensitive. So as well as capturing, you know, young people who had Force-sensitive abilities, what he kind of turned to first were Jedi that could be turned, either through torture or just basically by asking them. You know, the Grand Inquisitor was a person who was quite easy to convince because he was already disillusioned. But yeah, Proset Dibs. And... Uh, I just always like it when you get connections like that. It feels rewarding as a Star Wars fan. So yeah, they're the three Inquisitors that land on Mon Cala out of their ship. And Akbar, who is the chief of security on Mon Cala, goes up to stop them. They give him an Imperial writ, which is basically just an order from Palpatine demanding that you can't get involved with this. And if you do get intervene with what the Inquisitors are doing, we count this as an act of war against the Empire. Akbar is questioning this and then Darth Vader appears. Akbar then questions Darth Vader, and he says that they're hunting the Empire's enemies. And Akbar says, well, there's no Imperial enemies on Mon Cala. And then the Ambassador's ship, which has flown away by this point, then explodes in the air. And Vader turns and says, you are mistaken. Tarkin hears about this in his Star Destroyer, so he deploys landing crafts. He comments that they have chosen war. And the final panels of this comic show that a hooded Jedi figure is hidden away and is communicating with King Lee Char. The Jedi warns Lee Char of the Inquisitors, and he also knows that Vader is actually Skywalker. 
So that's the end of issue 13. Let's move on to issue 14. And I can't remember if I said it earlier, but for clarity, this arc itself is actually five issues long. Then issue number 18 is its own sort of standalone comic, and I'll get to that in a bit. And then annual number two is obviously another standalone comic in itself. So thought I'd throw that in there before we get moving again. Issue 14 starts with the Battle of Dak City. There's, I want to add in here that there's some absolutely incredible artwork in, in the entire Vader run. I mean, these Vader comics are my favorite comics of all time of anything, if I'm being completely honest with you. I think the artwork is incredible. The story is great. Loads of cool connections. But yeah, there's so many pages within this that could be posters in themselves and there's lots of double page spreads that just show an incredible amount of detail so if any of you guys who are listening haven't yet read the Darth Vader comics I really really recommend people do obviously listening to this show is great and you get sort of the majority of the information you need and connections etc but these comics if you're going to pick up any Star Wars comics there are the 2017 Darth Vader comics and the 2015 Darth Vader comics are the two strongest comics I'd say along with the 2016 Doctor Aphra comics they're weird and wonderful and quite different but the Darth Vader comics for me are just absolutely top tier. So it shows that there's lots of Imperials fighting a lot of Mon Cala. There's ships flying around and shooting at each other and all that kind of stuff. And it shows Vader and the Inquisitors land and then head for the palace to find King Lee Char, who has been speaking with the Jedi they're hunting for. One page just shows Vader remembering Lee Char's coronation in the Clone Wars. It shows Anakin's there and Padme and Ahsoka and things. So it's quite a nice little throwback. And then it comes back to sort of modern day in air quotes. And it shows that Lee Char wants the Imperials to leave without any Mon Cala bloodshed. So Lee Char is talking with Tarkin via comms, but he refuses to allow an investigation because he says it's just going to be an invasion. And he then warns Tarkin of their defences. The call then ends and Tarkin warns an Imperial officer of an incoming counterattack. It then shows that this Jedi that is hiding on Mon Cala is called Ferran Bar. Now, Ferenbar is an Ik Tochchi, so I-K-T-O-T-C-H-I, and... Their skin is peach slash brown generally. They have two large horns that protrude from their head, but they come downwards on either side of their face. And a famous one that you guys would recognize is actually in Revenge of the Sith. He's called Saisi Teen, and he was a Jedi Master who was killed by Palpatine when Mace Windu confronts Palpatine. You know, Palpatine reveals his lightsaber and then does that mental 720 spin thing. Absolutely destroys two Jedi immediately, has like two exchanges with Kit Fisto with the lightsaber, kills him and then fights Mace Windu. Well, one of the Jedi that was killed immediately was Saisi Tin and yeah, he's Iktochi. With Ferran Bar, he's got a few followers with him and one of them is actually someone called Verla. Now, the reason I mention Verla is that in the 2020 run of the Star Wars comics, she actually meets Luke Skywalker, and she's involved with one of the story arcs and things. I will be getting into that. It was one of the story arcs just before War of the Bounty Hunters. So as you guys may remember that in episode 69, I finished the 2015 Star Wars run, and so I'll be continuing in a couple weeks' time with the 2020 Star Wars run, so it's up to date with War of the Bounty Hunters and things. But yeah, Verla, she does appear again. And another little bit of information here is that Ferran Bar, when he's talking to his six followers, he's talking about Anakin Skywalker and that he was a Padawan in the temple at the same time that Anakin was, and that the Jedi all considered him to be the chosen one because of the prophecy and things. And Ferran Bar talks about Order 66, which is, you know, the Great Jedi Purge, and how Palpatine just lies and things, and then he talks to Lee Char. Now, before he speaks to Lee Char, he has a droid with him, and he shows his followers some footage and things of Anakin, and just, you know, gives background information and whatnot that you guys should probably already know. But if you want the specific details on that, obviously read the comics. But I just want to flag some fun little tidbit that written in Orobesh is actually the name of... Anakin Skywalker, which is the one that he selects, and it shows these videos and things. But some of the other names also on there are Darth Tyrannus, which is Count Dooku's Sith name, Darth Sidious, obviously Palpatine, Darth Maul, self-explanatory, Darth Plagueis, which is Sidious's master, Sifo Diaz, who, for more information on him, listen to my episode about Count Dooku and his whole sort of role in his life in it, in essence, because in the Kevin Scott audio drama called Dooku Jedi Lost, it goes into more detail about about Sifo Diaz's relationship with Count Dooku. And Sifo Diaz is mentioned, I think, is in season six of the Clone Wars, and it says that he was involved with the clone army being made. His name is first said in Attack of the Clones when Obi-Wan goes to Kamino and talks to uh, the cloners about him. But if you listen to episode 26 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, I provide a pretty detailed look into Count Dooku's life and him growing up and all those things, taking information from the Age of Republic Dooku comic, as well as the audio drama that I just mentioned a bit 
some pieces from other places. But yeah, Sifo Diaz was one of the key reasons that the clone army actually got made. Dooku manipulated him and then killed him in essence. But yeah, I just thought that was a fun little tidbit. Whenever I see Orobash writing in these comics, I always try and look up to see if I can find out what there are. Because there's sometimes little Easter eggs and fun things there. And just for clarity, Orobash is the standard language. It's like Galactic Basic in Star Wars. It is pronounced like English, really. And that's how Galactic Basic is spoken. But Orobash is generally how it's written. However, one other way to write it is how English people write it, hence why there are things called X-Wings, A-Wings and stuff, because even though the letter X in the Arabesh alphabet doesn't look like an X, people can speak Galactic Basic and write Galactic Basic in slightly different ways. So I want to flag that up as well. So moving back to Ferran Bar, so he's talking to Lee Char and mentions that the Mon Calamari are central to the liberation from the Empire, and he saw it in his vision. He says that Lee Char must take action. And shortly after that, Lee Char then tells Akbar and Radis to withdraw and activates a contingency. So Lee Char goes to the throne room to address his people, and Vader and the Inquisitors are there waiting for him. They try to extract information on the Jedi by, you know, throwing him around and basically torturing him, but also trying to pry into his mind, just like you see Kylo Ren do to Poe Dameron in The Force Awakens. And while this is all going on, there's some cool panels seeing some gigantic purple whale things fly swim up from the bottom of the ocean. They breach the surface, do this big belly slam on the water next to Dak City, and then this massive tidal wave comes across and starts flooding the Mon Calamari's cities, which was the contingency plan that Lee Char was speaking about. Vader and the Inquisitors try to shield themselves as the water starts to come in through Dak City and just taking out everyone, and it shows that Tarkin is notified of what's happened and it proves that has hindered the Imperials greatly, so they will now have to use aerial platforms to continue their assault. But there has been no word from Darth Vader and it shows him falling to the bottom of the ocean. And that's where issue number 14 ends. So issue number 15 starts with Vader underwater and it's showing that his systems that he can see through his visor shows that his oxygen levels are at 30% but there's far too much pressure being underwater for his suit. And I'm pretty sure that some people online have been discussing whether or not Vader's suit allows him to breathe in space and I think that this confirms that it does because obviously it's got some amount of oxygen built into it one would assume unless it was just for this one specific mission but I think there is another comic of Vader where he is outside of a spaceship, and I think I tackled it on the show, actually. So I I think Vader's suit must supply him with oxygen so he can survive in space for a little bit, I'd assume. Um, But I can't find explicit confirmation of that anywhere in canon. Anyway, his suit is experiencing too much pressure, so he uses the force to make like a bubble around him, and then the suit the warnings stop popping up and things and then he is grabbed by a giant squid it's quite a cool few panels where he basically kills this giant squid and it's fairly gruesome and then he is picked up by the inquisitors he's angry that they rescued him in air quotes instead of pursuing the jedi and it shows that kingly char is actually alive because obviously vader is filled with pride and doesn't want to be rescued by anyone but he also says well if you didn't get lee char and you tortured him and got the location of where the jedi is the first thing he's going to do is tell the jedi and they're going to escape so it shows that lee char gets picked up by his fellow mon Calas, and it shows the imperials are now sending out ground and air forces via their sky base which is just this floating platform it's flowing it's got almost what looks like jet engines on each corner so it is hovering above the water and there's an imperial officer on board that sees akbar is coming and the officer calls akbar a fool for being in the battle himself which i think quite nicely links with the empire where a lot of the higher ups don't get involved you know they don't get their hands dirty in essence whereas you see that with the rebellion it's the opposite you know aside from people like mon mothma um, um, you do see people like Leia and obviously Akbar and those sort of people who do get into the fight when required. So this sky base thing is attacked by Akbar. Um, they shoot some metal cases and then the metal cases open up and there's missiles inside them which penetrate the shield that the sky base has which destroys it. Now it is so effective even though the sky base had shields because these missiles are physical and they had those metal casings and things on they weren't energy projectiles which is what the shield around it was specifically for. Akbar is with quite a few other Mon Calamari warriors and they're on these ship things but they look cool but they're not elsewhere in the canon so read the if you want to see what they look like. After the sky base is destroyed, Akbar returns back to the recovering Lee Char and he discusses a truce. Lee Char refuses and says that they don't want to do a truce with the Empire 
and he wants to save his people as well as the galaxy. Akbar questions if that is the Jedi talking, talking about saving the galaxy, and then Lee Char immediately panics and then communicates with the Jedi, warning him that the Inquisitors tortured Lee Char and got them their location. He then shows Tarkin is on his Star Destroyer, and when he finds out that the Skybase was destroyed by the missiles, he is annoyed by the Imperial officer and his lack of intel, because the person who is meant to be getting all the information on the Mon Cala people before attacking them, obviously he didn't know about those giant whale things that caused the tidal wave, and he didn't know about these special missiles that weren't energy projectiles either, so Tarkin sends the officer to become a stormtrooper, and says hopefully you'll be helpful in that way. And then the comic ends with Tarkin saying that instead of retaliating, they need to escalate their attack. So that's issue number 15. Let's move on to issue number 16. It starts with Ferrum Bar evacuating his followers. He tells the droid that's there to back up the files to disk and then to self-destruct. He takes the disk and goes off, which is, you know, the information about Plagueis and Anakin and all those sorts of other things that I mentioned prior. They go to leave with suits and also these vessels that they've got because they're in this cave of some sort and there's like a pool of water in the middle so they get all their suits on to jump into this pool of water in the middle now the vessels that they're using are actually called underwater turbo sled pikes or uts pikes and you get to see them once in the clone wars episodes um, that i mentioned prior they're basically it's almost like a triangle that you hold on to that flies underwater so Ferenbart and his followers are in this water trying to escape the location and Vader's ship with the Inquisitors on intercepts. One follower stays behind to try and shoot Vader's ship. The shot bounces off Vader's ship and then Vader crushes his helmet, which obviously kills him. And then in this issue, it's quite interesting because each follower that gets killed, you see how they got involved with Ferran Bar in the first place. So this one, it shows that his sister was killed in the Jedi Purge because his sister was a Jedi. And so Ferran Bar offers him justice. Now, the justice that he offers, he does it with a mind trick, which is quite interesting. So you see him move his hand as he says it. And then this gentleman says the same thing. I'm not going to name all of the other followers because they seem to only be in this comic, apart from Verla, who obviously I mentioned earlier, shows up again. But yeah, so that's one down. So the remaining group head to Bell City and then another follower gets killed. He just seemingly explodes. It shows that he lost his home and he goes to this place, speaks to Ferenbar and once again, Ferenbar mind tricks him into following him. The remaining group managed to get into this structure and then there's air there now. So they climb out of the water and can take their suits off. And then there's a couple who stay behind to defend. While this is happening, Tarkin comments on Radis's brilliant strategy, angling the ships up and firing them from basically bubble-protected area. So the ships, which are the Mon Calamari ships, they are called MC-80 Star Cruisers. They're rounded and every ship is unique in its make. Uh, you see them in Return of the Jedi, that's when you first get to see them, but there's a ship which is the MC-80A, so the same with the letter A after it, and there's a ship called the MC-80A Home One Type Heavy Cruiser, which is a variant of these ships. And Akbar actually has a ship of his own called the Home One. Now, it's a modified version of the MC-80A, and it was actually at the Battle of Endor. It's what you see when you meet Akbar, and, you know, he has that famous line, it's a trap. The ship that he is on is the Home One, which is that MC-80A variant. And the last bit of information on this, which is the ship called the Radis, which was in The Last Jedi, as I mentioned prior, was a MC-85 Star Cruiser. It was initially called the Dawn of Tranquility, but Akbar requested it got renamed to the Radis when it got put into the Resistance. And a little bit of history here for when the sequel trilogy kind of happened. It gets explained in the book Bloodline by Claudia Gray, which is a good reader. I do recommend it. And it's about Leia. It's, a th I'm trying to remember, I think it's about 10 years or so after Return of the Jedi, or it's about 10 or 15 years before The Force Awakens. Now, there's 30 years between Return of the Jedi and Force Awakens, so it's it's somewhat in the middle there. And what happened was when the New Republic took over and things, they were so certain that there wasn't going to be an uprising of the remnants of the Empire or anything like that. They started to demilitarize. So they stopped putting resources into an army or into ships or anything. They started retiring a lot of warships and whatnot. So they basically left the New Republic to be quite defenseless. Leia could see this was happening. And so in retaliation, she created the Resistance. She did this secretly. She did it with Akbar and a few other people as well. So slowly over time, when the New Republic public was basically demilitarizing everything. Leia was quietly hiding away ships and people who had the same sort of mindset as her, worrying that something like the Empire would eventually rise again, which obviously is what you get to see in Force Awakens. 
And it's quite easy to remember what the Mon Cala ships are called, rather than being called really random other things. It's just MC, Mon Cala, and then 80 or 85. So nice and easy to remember there. But there's your little history lesson on the Mon Calamari ships and whatnot. And uh, so back to the story itself. So I mentioned about Radis's brilliant strategy. So you've got these Mon Cala ships. They are seemingly at the bottom of the ocean and they are facing upwards out of the ocean and if they kept going forward they would in theory fly into space and whatnot so they connect uh, five or six ships together and then there's this bubble that forms around them and it acts as like a protection but they can shoot from outside of this bubble so whenever the empire are trying to attack them and things most of the shots that are fired against the mon calamari ships don't get to them because they just hit this bubble but anything that the mon calamari ships shoot out manage to hit them And I realize I keep saying Mon Cala and Mon Calamari. Just for full clarity, to clear up any confusion, the planet itself is called Mon Cala. It is also sometimes known as Mon Calamari, just to confuse people. But it is also called DAC, D-A-C. And obviously earlier I mentioned it was the Battle of DAC City. So that's a little bit of information there. It's in the Mon Calamari system, so that's easy to remember. And obviously the two aquatic species that live on there that I've mentioned, the Mon Calamari and the Quarren. The Mon Calamari, so Akbar's people, were specifically known for their shipbuilding. So in essence, the Mon Calamari people were creating the ships and things, which is what you see in the Rebel Alliance and etc. and what I'm generally talking about whereas the Quarren ran the Free DAC Volunteers Engineering Corps. So they worked together on the planet itself, but the ships were pretty much always made by the Mon Calamari, hence why they're called MC-80 or 85. And there are plenty of other Mon Calamari ships and things, um, which are called MC something or others, but I'm not going to go through all of them now, uh, because I'll be here for ages. So back to the story. After talking comments about Radis, he then communicates with Darth Vader. He asks him to go and get King Lee Char. And Vader doesn't want to because he's like, you know, we're about to get this Jedi. And Tarkin says, if you do this, I will owe you a favor. Vader ponders for a moment and then decides to leave the Inquisitors to go and get Ferran Bar and his remaining followers and then heads off. He shows that Ferran Bar is at a dead end. So he got through all the structure and things and then him and Verla are just in this area now with nowhere really to go. It's confirmed that the couple who stay behind are now dead and they wanted to join Ferran Bar and do something with themselves because they could see the Imperial occupation happening. And it's not exactly clear if he did use a mind trick on them, but they seemed fairly willing to go with him anyway. So yeah, Ferran Bar is now with that Verla person and one other individual. Then before they can think, this other individual gets cut in half by a red lightsaber that was thrown. It was confirmed that the reason he joined Ferran Bar was because during the Clone Wars, he was actually saved by Anakin Skywalker from some Separatist droids, which obviously is an ironic twist. Ferran Bar and Verla then turn to see the Inquisitors coming towards them with a bunch of troopers. Ferran Bar calls out the Inquisitors' Jedi names, and he names each of them, and he mentions that the past does not die. Ferran Bar confirms that he studies and the history a lot, and it's very, very important. He uses the Force to remove the helmets of the troopers who are with them, and it shows that they are young clones. They are actually the last clone batch that were made. And this comic ends with him saying, Once a Jedi, always a Jedi. He waves his hand and says, Execute Order 66. So issue number 17, which is the final part of the Burning Seas arc in particular, and it starts off with the clones firing upon the Inquisitors because Ferran Bar activated Order 66 and because the Inquisitors there were Jedi previously, they start shooting at the Inquisitors. Verla and Ferran Bar manage to jump over the whole group of now this Inquisitors fighting these clones and as he jumps over, you know, deflecting a couple of bolts that go their way and as they're escaping, Ferran Bar mentions Obi-Wan, Yoda and Quinlan Vos are surviving and he tells Verla that she needs to hide, wait for this war to go and then find someone else who can help train her because he has something else to do. Meanwhile, the sixth brother and the ninth sister push some clones out of the way using the force and then as they begin to escape, the sixth brother then cuts the ninth sister's leg off to escape. Vader gets to Lee Char and Tarkin communicates with him and says to show him the window. And then Tarkin Star Destroyer and the other Star Destroyers around them then start to fire on Mon Cala, firing down a pretty hefty bombardment. Lee Char says that Mon Cala is the key to destroying the Empire and then Ferran Bar enters. Ferran Bar and Darth Vader start to fight but the bombing still continues. Radis then tells his people to scatter some of the cruisers because this bombardment is slowly making their way towards where Radis is. So you've got Vader and Ferran Bar fighting and Ferran Bar says that he will be the reason the Empire shall fall and it's confirmed that he was the one who actually killed the Imperial Ambassador right at the start of this comic which basically started the whole war on Mon Cala. 
He confirmed that time was running out and he didn't want the inevitable conflict to be delayed and plus he was going to get found soon so it was a good distraction. Lee Char is obviously distraught by this so he comes to Tarkin and then immediately surrenders. Tarkin says he accepts his surrender but then continues the bombardment of his people. So Radis then sends out some unarmed ships to escape. A subordinate of his questions it but he says look if we stay here we're going to die anyway. At least if we send some of these ships out there's a chance they'll survive. It shows while Ferenbar and Vader are fighting, Ferenbar starts to get some crazy looks in his eyes and then starts laughing maniacally is the only way I can describe it. Lee Char is questioning why he's laughing. He's saying, you know, my planet is dying. You said the Mon Calamari would save the galaxy that you foresaw it. And I'm just going to read out what Ferenbar says because I think it's quite interesting and paraphrasing it won't really do it justice. So Ferenbar says, and I did. I did not lie to you, your majesty. A time will come, decades from now, when the ships of the Mon Calamari are at the forefront of a great rebellion, and then, again, decades after that. Your people's vessels will be a symbol of freedom and defiance across the galaxy, and it all started here, your majesty, with you. And Lee Char says, billions of people are dying. And Ferenbar says, billions, who will inspire trillions, as was the plan. And Vader says, you are no Jedi. And Bar says, perhaps not, not anymore. Makes two of us, eh? But I made my choices, and I might not be a Jedi, but I still beat the Sith. And while this is happening, you're seeing some of these Mon Calamari ships coming out of the oceans and flying into space. Some of them get shredded by the Star Destroyers that are there, but three of them manage to get away. And I just want to clarify what Ferenbar was saying, obviously, was that the Mon Calamari people are going to join the Rebellion, which is what he said, and then also they all join the next big fight, which is obviously in the sequel trilogy, when you see Akbar get involved, uh, and then also in the Star Wars Allegiances comic, which I tackled on episode 7 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, which shows Akbar's son speaking with Leia and things, and then explains how he's involved in the Rise of Skywalker. So that was quite a cool little nod as well. But continuing with the story, Tarkin then ceases fire and allows those three Mon Calamari ships to escape, saying that since three ships won't make a difference, and besides they're out of range, they've put their rear deflector shields up, they're going to be able to jump to light speed before the Star Destroyers will be able to catch up to them and do any real damage, so Tarkin just leaves them. And the final panels of this comic, they're, they're really, really good. It's, it's very cool, like great artwork. It shows that Verla is hidden away with a couple of Quarren. The sixth brother manages to get away, and then there is one single clone left in that room that was a dead end, just head in his hands looking at all that has happened around him and Lee Char says to Darth Vader that Mon Cala will rise Vader says that Mon Cala is gone and it shows that Ferenbar is dead on the floor and Vader finishes this comic by saying there is only the Empire now so that's the end of the Burning Seas arc but as I said I'm doing the whole trade paperback of these issues so there's two more to go there's the annual and also issue number 18 so moving on to issue number 18 it is its own one shot story in a sense and I would say if you guys are going to pick up and read any story at all this is the one that I think really shines out so the burning seas story is really cool it works really well sort of the wider star wars canon and whatnot but this story itself issue 18 it could almost be its own short film its own little movie I'm going to obviously explain the plot points and things because it is relevant, but I really recommend people read it because it's all narrated by Tarkin and it is really, really good. It's some of the best writing I think I've seen in uh, Star Wars comics. So it's set approximately four years later. So it's approximately 14 years before the Battle of Yavin. It is set after the events of the book Tarkin, but it's set before the events of the game Jedi Fallen Order. And I think both Tarkin and Fallen Order are around 14 years before the Battle of Yavin, so it's it's in between those two. So issue 18 starts with Tarkin on a planet called Chandler's Folly, which is mentioned br- very briefly in Light of the Jedi, which is obviously the High Republic book written by Charles Saul, which I did a book review as well, for, so make sure you go check that out if you haven't already. So Tarkin starts with 20 men at first, and they are hunting, but now there are only 8 left, including Tarkin. Turns out they are hunting Darth Vader, who is currently wearing a Valath skin and is without his lightsaber. Now, Valath is only in the story, as far as I can tell. It's basically the apex predator of this planet, and its skin is actually like a cloak. So Vader's wearing like the skin tied around his neck, but the skin itself can cloak someone. I, I'd probably match it to Predator, if you guys, I would assume a lot of you guys have seen Predator. Excellent film. But it's just a cloaking thing. It makes him basically invisible and near enough, and Vader is wearing that. But Tarkin can see Vader just standing on this ridge with the Valath skin wrapped around him, but not using using its camouflage abilities so Vader is showing he can be seen. Then the structure of this comic is really good because it kind of goes back and explains Tarkin's journey, how he got to where he is now, and kind of how he's been figuring out Vader. That's basically the, the premise of this. 
I mean, the story itself is just called Bad Ground. And as I said, it's issue 18. I really recommend people check it out. And it's it's just getting into the mind of Tarkin and also getting to know Vader and his limits somewhat. It, it's a really interesting read. But I'm going to try and do it somewhat justice. But this is one of the ones why I would recommend people pick it up. So Tarkin notes that blasters are useless against Vader. He tried using flame weapons against him and Vader blew them up, which led to Tarkin losing four men initially. But Tarkin learned a great deal at this point. Then on the fourth day, they managed to take Vader's lightsaber, which cost them six men. Then Tarkin sent more men to test the range of Darth Vader's force abilities. And Tarkin also notes that Vader's lightsaber was very important to him. And Vader may not even realize how he shows how important his lightsaber is to him, because often when he's talking to Palpatine, he seems to touch it without realizing. So then shows slightly more present day, and I am skipping over little bits and pieces here, and it shows that Tarkin has actually got two Shadrafan trackers with them because they have great hearing and can hear Vader's breathing from quite far away. Now Shadrafan, I have mentioned these in a prior episode of Star Wars Comics and Canon, I think, and in essence they are kind of like bat rodent people. They're generally about a meter tall, and you actually see them in A New Hope, and they're primarily in Star Wars Resistance, which is an animated show that I don't talk about that much on this. Um, I've seen it all now. It's not amazing. It's all right. If you're desperate for more animated Star Wars content and you've watched Clone Wars, Rebels and The Bad Batch, maybe give Resistance a go. But the, for my, in my opinion, the first series is quite weak. There are some cool elements to the Resistance show. There's like certain cool bits here and there. It more so the things that get added to the universe, certain like species and whatnot. But the plot itself and the characters aren't like phenomenal. Um, but anyway, the Sh- there's Shadra fan in that. And interestingly enough, although the Shadra fan are in the original trilogy and also the sequel trilogy, they're not in the prequel trilogy. The last bit of information about the Shadra fan, because they're so small and things, certain creatures actually view them as lesser beings, and some even view them as pets, which is quite mean. But they are fully sentient, they're intelligent beings, they're just like small bat rodent things. So Tarkin and the remaining hunters he's got and the two Chadra fan, they're in this sort of canyony area and they can hear Vader's breathing echoing all around them. It's causing them confusion, they can't figure out where it is, and then Vader manages to kill two more of the people tracking. The group then flee and they can't hear Vader breathing anymore, so they set up camp in the Stormlands, which have been noted as quite dangerous. While they're around camp and whatnot, kind of pondering what to do next, one of the Shadra fan just dies, and then us as the viewer can see that Vader used the Velath skin as a cape. Then us as viewers can see that Vader actually used this cape that he's made out of the Velath skin and is actually cloaking himself. And interestingly enough, he actually stops his own breathing so he isn't detected. And Tarkin notes that it seems that Vader is actually literally dying as he is killing Tarkin's men just so he could hunt them. And Tarkin knows he wasn't even aware that Vader could even turn off his own breathing, uh, which is quite an interesting thing because I don't think that's even been addressed in this uh, before either. So Vader manages to get his lightsaber back and then he just kills even more of them. And Tarkin notes that he seems to almost come to life when he gets his saber back. He continues breathing once the saber is in his hands again. And shortly after that, all of the men that Tarkin brought with him are dead. So Tarkin runs away and Vader is slowly following him and Tarkin starts to run out of breath and eventually just gives up. He goes on his knees and puts his hand behind his head and Vader stands over him. Lightning then strikes Vader pretty harshly and Vader collapses to the floor, obviously because they were in those stormlands I mentioned, and then Tarkin calls for a ship to pick them up. It's confirmed that the reason all this is actually going on is because Vader had actually asked Tarkin to hunt him to cash in that favour that Tarkin obviously offered him in the previous arc we spoke about. And at this point, Tarkin thinks that he's basically won and beaten Vader. Then he notes that Vader's fingers twitch, and then Tarkin starts to choke. He nearly collapses on the floor, and Vader stops so that Tarkin doesn't actually die. Tarkin notes that Vader's strength is incalculable, and that Tarkin is very lucky that Vader is on the side of the Empire. And that is where that comic ends. As I said, there is so much more to this comic. It's so cool. And hearing what Tarkin's thinking and kind of how he's hunting and reviewing Vader. And he does mention towards the end that, you know, the reason that Vader wanted him to hunt, he presumes, is because Vader's kind of bored. Because obviously at this point, this is like five years after the Jedi Purge. So for the first year or two, Vader was quite busy going around like killing Jedi and things. But by this point, the majority of Jedi that would be left are already in hiding. People like, you know, Obi-Wan and Yoda and... I think at present in canon, we don't know what's happened to Quinlan Voss. Um, we know he survived through the Clone Wars. He's in the book Dark Disciple. So he's survived the purge as far as we know, but he hasn't shown up anywhere else at this point of recording. 
So there's a few Jedi that are left, and obviously there's some other ones, you know, uh, Cal Kestis in Jedi Fallen Order, Ahsoka, and there's some characters in Rebels, etc. So there are a few left, but all of those are quite good at hiding at the moment. And where Vader's, you know, Force-sensitive and it's so incredibly powerful, anyone who isn't Force-sensitive is pretty much never really much of a threat to him. So Tarkin just assumes that Vader must be kind of bored and wants to know that he can still be challenged somewhat. But he says that this is all just an assumption because obviously Vader didn't tell him anything. So if that comic finished, that is up to issue 18 of the 2017 Darth Vader run, which means I'm on to the final comic, which is included in the trade paperback. And this is Darth Vader Annual Number 2. And it appears that Annual Number 2 actually takes place around 18 years before the Battle of Yavin. So as far as I can tell, I believe that this annual takes place after the Burning Seas arc, but obviously it's several years before the events of Bad Ground that I just mentioned. Being the trade paperback, it is actually right at the end of it, so... I'm just giving them to you guys in the same order it would be if you read them on trade paperback or collection or whatever, uh, just in case anyone's questioning why, even though timeline-wise this is technically before Bad Ground, why I did it afterwards, is because this is his own isolated story. So it's called Technological Terror, and I'm going to read the crawl for this one. The Republic is overthrown and the Jedi defeated. Emperor Palpatine, Dark Lord of the Sith, rules the galaxy with an iron fist. Order and security is bloodily maintained by Palpatine's apprentice, the fearsome Darth Vader whose fall to the dark side of the Force and defeat at the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi leaves him confined to a suit of cybernetic armour to preserve his life. Now, Vader lives only to serve his master's empire, but he isn't Palpatine's only weapon. The Emperor has many loyal servants, such as Governor Wilhuff Tarkin, whose plans to safeguard the new order could threaten even Darth Vader's powerful position. And just to reiterate to you guys, the writer for this is Chuck Wendig, the penciler is Leonard Kirk, the inkers are Walden Wong and Scott Hanna, and the colour artist is Nolan Woodard. And Chuck Wendig did the Aftermath trilogy of books, which are excellent, and there's a little connection in here that I'll mention when we get onto it. Uh, so with that in mind, let's get on to the story. So Tarkin heads to the Scarif Data Vault and confronts Darth Vader who's looking at Project Stardust. Anyone who has seen Rogue One, which I hope you guys all have because it's excellent, knows that Scarif was heavily into Rogue One and Project Stardust is the Death Star. Vader's not authorised to look at all this information, so Tarkin communicates with Palpatine who then sends Vader to Geonosis and also tells Vader that Tarkin has full authority over him. As a reminder, Geonosis is the desert planet that is in Attack of the Clones, and it is where the first battle of the Clone Wars was ever fought. And some people don't get this when they see Attack of the Clones, but the Death Star plans were actually originally created by the Geonosians. Poggle the Lesser, who is the leader of the Geonosians, he gives the plans to the Death Star to Count Dooku towards the end of Attack of the Clones, just before Dooku flies off and tries to flee, and then you know that's still before he fights Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Yoda. So if you miss that, when you next see it, it's only on screen for about five seconds or so, but he does give it to Dooku, and it's quite an interesting thing that the Geonosians actually started to create the Death Star. So on Geonosis, Vader meets Orson Krennic, who is the main antagonist of Rogue One, played by Ben Mendelsohn, I think his name is. He meets him on the landing pad, and then there is an explosion up above them, and it causes lots of rubble to fall down. Vader obviously manages to save them from being killed by that, but then it's confirmed that Orson Krennic thinks that Tarkin was the person who orchestrated this, but he doesn't have any evidence of this. Krennic then also mentions that there's been other sabotage as well, which have all contributed to the numerous delays of the Death Star. He lists them all as a panel of it that looks quite cool, but it's not necessarily relevant. So Vader, he goes to investigate, and he heads to a place called the Petronac Arena. Now, this is the place which was in Attack of the Clones, which is when Anakin, Padme, and Obi-Wan fought those creatures. You know, the, the giant praying mantis thing, which is the Atclay that fought Obi-Wan. There's the Nexu, which is the sort of canine hyena alien thing that scratched Padme. And then there's the Reek, that is like the rhino thing that fought Anakin. He has like a little flashback while he's walking in this arena, seeing, you know, flashes of what I just described. An Imperial officer confronts him who's called Sid Udra. Now, Sid Udra is actually a loyalty officer. So they're the kind of people who, among the Empire, they make sure that Imperial officers are not traitors and not supplying information to the rebels. They will often interrogate people and torture them and that sort of thing. And interestingly enough, she's mentioned in the Aftermath Life Debt book, which is written by Chuck Wendick, this little connection I mentioned. One of the main characters in the Aftermath trilogy is called Sinja Rath Velas. And Sinja, he's a great character. He's really cool. He's one of the highlights of the book trilogy, if you ask me. 
And so Sid Udra was actually his mentor when he was in the Empire. So Vader and Sid discuss whether or not Tarkin or Krennic were betraying the Empire. But Sid says it's very unlikely because both of them are so loyal to the Empire, even though they hate each other, they would rather just let something bad happen and blame the other one rather than explicitly sabotaging it and potentially having themselves to blame. She mentions that Galen Erso may be someone to check out, so Vader heads to Galen Erso's office on Coruscant. In the office, he finds lots of kyber crystals, and he also finds a Geonosian egg, which is called an Utheka, and he then confronts Orson Krennic about this. Krennic doesn't know why he's got this egg thing, he says it might have just got on there by accident, so then Vader goes to a Korokani mound with some death troopers. And death troopers, they're just elite stormtroopers, you saw them in Rogue One, they, they wear all black, and if anyone's been watching the Bad Batch, some of the armour that Crosshair was wearing, it looks like that may have been some sort of precursor to death troopers, but they're just elite stormtroopers that also have like voice modulator things to kind of scramble their voices, so when they talk you can't really hear what they're saying, unless you know, you're know you in their communication with them and have like a communication unscrambler but anyway Vader and his squad find some Geonosius with a queen and there's a really cool few panels of him just killing all of them including the queen now Geonosians they're like these the bug creature sort of things and they need queens to lay eggs to birth them in essence it reminds me a little bit of Aliens actually um, the James Cameron movie with the Xenomorphs and I wouldn't be surprised if they were inspirations for some element of the Geonosians so Vader reports to Tarkin, and he confirms that he slaughtered the Geonosians like animals. Nice little throwback to Anakin there. And Tarkin is aboard the Carrion Spike. Now, the Carrion Spike is Tarkin's own ship. Uh, it shows up in the book Tarkin, as well as some books and comics and whatnot, and actually shows in the Poe Dameron comics, um, written by Charles Saul, which I will be tackling on this show in the future. And the Resistance try and kind of liberate the Carrion Spike for themselves, but it eventually gets destroyed by the First Order. When Vader confronts Tarkin, he confirms that he figures out that the Death Star is a planet killer. So Vader and Tarkin have like a back and forth, they argue a little bit, Vader saying that it is a technological aberration. And then Tarkin rebuttals with, Vader, you are a technological aberration as well. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the technology. And Tarkin says that it seems that maybe Vader is a little bit jealous that the Death Star will be the technological aberration that can do far more than Vader can do, and is like outshining him. Vader says that Tarkin has too much faith in the Death Star and it could be his tomb. Tarkin asks if that is a threat and Vader says no, it's a prediction. Which, in the end, he is actually right, isn't he? Because that's where, where Tarkin dies in New Hope. And then the final pages of this comic show that Lyra Erso is studying Kyber, which is Jin Erso's mum. You see her at the start of Rogue One. She's wearing like a necklace with a little bit of Kyber around it. And she's studying some Kyber crystals and things as it is something that's always intrigued her, and she's like a specialist on them. And then this RA7 protocol droid is sent to warn her that what she's doing is helping with a planet killer. And before she can ask any other questions, this protocol droid self-destructs. She then panics, immediately communicates with Galen Erso, and says, I think we have to run. And just for clarity, an RA7 protocol droid um, is basically like 3PO, but they've got like quite big bug eyes. Uh, I've mentioned them before. They are nicknamed like Death Star droids, because when in episode four, they got on the Death Star, there's quite a few of them around, and they're primarily used for service in the Empire. And uh, yeah, that, that's where the annual ends. So I'm, I've seen some people online talking about it, about what it's kind of alluding to is that Vader may have actually hinted to Lyra Erso and um, by proxy Galen or so, that the project they're developing is going to be destroying planets. And if that is the case, uh, then Vader, in essence, is the reason that the Death Star, some 18 years later, actually gets destroyed. Which, depending how you look at it, is actually a benefit to Vader, because if that, because of all those events that happened, Palpatine does eventually get killed. Obviously, Vader does, you know, turn back to the light and becomes a Force Ghost, which is a much more enjoyable way to spend eternity than just being dead. So, it's a strange thing. I'm not sure how I feel about it. It's it's kind of like, do I think Vader would have actually betrayed the Empire and everything to destroy the Death Star and all those things? Maybe. I mean, in the Darth Vader comics from 2015 by uh, Kieran Gillen, which I tackled, you know, tens of episodes ago, which when uh, Dr. Aphra appears, he is trying to undermine Palpatine a lot. But a lot of the time, it seems like Vader is trying to undermine Palpatine, get out of being a slave and potentially rule the galaxy himself. I don't know if he would actually go and try and destroy a Death Star, like subtly and quietly. I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced on that way. But then this was, you know, only about a year or so after Revenge of the Sith. So one could argue that he was still 
you know, he wasn't quite as Vader-ish as he is towards the original trilogy. You know, he's still quite defiant then in some ways. He's still kind of trying to figure out what it's all about. And obviously he thought he was the chosen one and thinks that he's all all that in essence. So I guess it, it can work. Um, it works somewhat in the characters and things, but I'd be interested to know what you guys think about that sort of element. Do you think Darth Vader would actually have it in him a year after Revenge of the Sith to potentially be the catalyst to the Death Star being destroyed? But um, yeah, that is... Darth Vader 13 to 18 and the Darth Vader annual number two. It's a lot of talking from me as per standard with these episodes and a lot of connections made and a lot of fun to be had rereading all of these things. As I said, the Darth Vader comics are just incredible. I highly recommend them to everyone, especially that bad ground one. If you've got a Hoopla or if you've got Marvel Unlimited and you're listening to me right now and you haven't read it in a while or you've not read it at all, just go to bad ground number 18 and just read it. It takes five maybe ten minutes to read the whole thing and it is well worth it. it is a lot of fun but aside from that guys what have we got coming up in the future then so next week it should be the next volume of the dr afra comics so that'll be issue six onward and that'll bring dr afra fully up to date with the war of the bounty hunters big crossover event that i've been tackling So that's probably what I'm going to be doing next week. I have recently finished the Rising Storm High Republic book by Cavan Scott. So I'm going to do a book review on that shortly. But first, I need to do the book review on Claudia Gray's Into the Dark, which is the last of the High Republic books from the first three. So there were the first three, which was Light of the Jedi, Into the Dark, and A Test of Courage, which I tackled, you know, the other two as a book review already. So I was going to do Into the Dark. Then I was going to do The Rising Storm. I'm soon to read Race to crash point tower and then i have yet to buy out of the shadows so i'm going to try and maybe every month or couple of months to do these book reviews and things uh, to give you guys bits and pieces of information of what's going on in the high republic um, which will give you some more background information as to when i start tackling the high republic comics uh, because the high republic comics they run really well with the main books so the, the big books light of the jedi and the rising storm uh, because you know i'm reading them at the moment and there's events that happen that are directly connected to what happens in those books. So I'd rather do a book review on them, give you guys like some vague idea of what they are before delving into the story of the High Republic and stuff. Because when I get into the High Republic comics, it will spoil somewhat some of the events that happen in the other two books. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Next week is either going to be the Dr. Aphra um, comic or it's going to be the Into the Dark book review. And, you know, if I choose one, then it will probably be the other one the following week. Uh, and then the week after that, that I'll be on to the next chapter of the War of the Bounty Hunters. So that'll be chapter three, I believe, of that sort of big crossover event. And then the week after that will be the main run of Star Wars comics. And that'll be the 2020 run, um, which is quite exciting. And I, I can't remember if the first arc is where you meet Verla. I think it's the second arc, which is one of the followers of Ferran Bar in this one. Uh, I've only read them once um, because obviously I knew I was going to be doing them at some point soon for this podcast. And I didn't make loads of notes. Cause <laughs> when I get the comics in the first instance, I just read them for fun. And then when I do them for the podcast, I then go through them again and make sure I write down any connections I spot and then do a bit of research and things. So that's really what you can expect from Star Wars Comics and Canon coming up. Um, I've also got a very exciting, two very exciting guests, actually. One of them I'm going to be speaking to on Monday, um, and they've just doubly confirmed they're all good to go with that one. So they are a content creator more aligned with myself and it's just gonna be a lot of fun to talk to them and you know i don't want to spoil it um so that'll be released on genuine chit chat and you know i'll probably release it on this feed as well to be honest um what i may do is release it on this feed in the same week i do the book review i'm not overly sure i'll, I'll figure it out you know next week when i uh when i'm not at the end of a work day and my brain's all melted uh so i'm very very excited about that and then i won't say who but i've reached out to one of the artists of some of the Star Wars comics I've actually been tackling on this and he has agreed to come on the show I need to send him an email and organize a time and a date and things but that means that I'll have had Claudia Gray on the show which is obviously December 2020 I'm in talks with a couple of people regarding some of the authors of other Star Wars uh, comic and book content and I'll also have had one of the artists who has drawn certain characters for the Star Wars comics that I'm, I'm very very excited to talk to this individual so 
those are exciting things. Um, I haven't been in any other guest spots as of recent, aside from the Comics and Motion Book Club, uh, Volume 2. That is on the Art Spiegelman book, Mouse, um, which was a book about the Holocaust. It is very dark. It's very heavy, but an absolutely incredible conversation with it. Um, joining me, well, I wasn't the host. Dave Horrocks was the host. I was just a simple guest, along with Tony Farina of Indie Comic Spotlight, um, Super Dummy Paul of the Superheroes for Dummies podcast, as well as the podcast called Geek. The, if you're a fan of Comics and Motion, make sure you check out the feed of Fantastic Universes, which is uh, part of Steve J. Ray's following how else to describe it you know he's got his website fantastic universes that does all kinds of comic reviews and then the podcast of fantastic universes has at the moment i think two podcast shows that run on it one is the hostile takeover which is by adam j ray and that's about gaming and stuff and the other one is geek and i've been on geek tony freen has been on geek most of the people in comics emotion either have been on geek or the episodes are soon to be released of them so if you want to hear some people's geek origin stories check that out and also joining us was ria who is a newer member of the Comics Emotion family. She's been on Seasons Greetings. She's been doing the Pop Gorillas and she's been involved with a few other things as well. So that was a lot of fun. So yeah, that's the Comics Emotion book club. As of recording this right now, it's not yet out. I think it's coming out in the next few days. I will try and remember to put a link in the description. But if you're listening to this on a podcast app, on the feed of Comics in Motion. You should see it when it pops up. If you're listening on YouTube, you know, go out to Comics in Motion on wherever you want to listen to podcasts and you'll be able to find it there. Um, aside from that, there's I was on the Beer Nuts Productions podcast. Um, we recorded that a while ago. I think over the next few weeks that's going to be coming out. So I'll let you guys know about that. And then I'm going to try and do some more guest spots and stuff over the coming weeks. I've just been really busy with my own stuff, trying not to, you know, fill up all my time solely with podcasting. I do want to spend at least some time with Megan <laughs> and also, you know, consuming content that isn't Star Wars related as well uh, is something I want to try and do. And I've been going to the cinema recently. I went and saw uh, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings last night and I thought it was absolutely incredible. I was blown away by how good it was. So if anyone is on the fence about watching that because you're not interested by the character or you think that they won't do the martial arts in the film justice, I can tell you with all assurance, they do. It's very, very, very well-made film. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it's arguably one of the strongest of the solo marvel films so not the avengers ones or the 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 ones where like everyone is in it you know like civil war and the four main avengers movies just the individual solo movies that are the titular character in the name of the film i think it's one of the strongest ones of that so that was really really good I think on my Patreon, I'll be releasing uh, an afterthoughts about that at some point. Um, but yeah, check out my other show, Genuine Chit Chat, where, you know, you can listen to a lot of the interviews and things I do with other people. I say interviews, it's just recorded conversations. Um, I had part one has dropped with Jack of I Am Jack's Musings, who's also Seasons Greetings, who also does Pop Gorillas, and he is absolutely amazing and um, we spoke about movies for like over two hours so part one of that is out now part two will be coming out on sunday so it'll be the day after this is released for you guys and aside from that guys check out my patreon patreon.com slash genuine chit chat for as little as one pound a month which you know realistically what you guys spend in shops and all those sorts of other things it's not that much to add on to your monthly incomings from my perspective but i'm a little bit biased aren't i uh, you can get you know hours and hours of additional content you get me and megan talking about movie reviews and stuff they're like 10 to 20 minutes long generally we release one of those a week sometimes two depending also you get early access to episodes of genuine chit chat so whenever I release a part one and part two you get access to the full unsplit episode in when part one drops and also normally when i do book reviews i usually seem to edit them and finish them before saturday so whenever i do that i release them on that feed as well a little bit early and then if you contribute two pound a month or more you get access to more stuff on patreon including future guest lists there's like a big list of either things that are coming out for genuine chit chat certain guests that have confirmed they're going to come on but i haven't organized a time with them guest spots as well as previous for afterthoughts and things and also on thursdays i will almost always i forget on the odd occasion but on thursdays i do post the photos for styles comics and canon i normally post them on social media on saturdays along with the post announcing the episode so it's up, but I do post them on there as well early. So if you want to support the show, you want to get extra content and stuff, and you want to just show your appreciation for me in a financial way, consider checking out patreon.com slash genuine chit chat. It means the absolute world to me that you guys listen to the show, and it means even more to me that some of you are willing to support the show financially. So thank you very much to all of those lovely people. But that's enough for me, guys. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you listening all the way to the end here. I hope you have great weeks and things. I will talk to you next Saturday with either Dr. Afra or the book review or part of the conversation I'm having with these individuals involved with Star Wars. We shall see. And as always, guys, may the Force be with you. The 
The intro for Star Wars Comics and Canon is arranged by myself, Mike Burton, and the backing music was made by Eric Matias of soundimage.org. You have just experienced host, creator, everything else of genuine chit-chat, and also the host and creator of Star Wars Comics and Canon, found on the Comics in Motion podcast, Mike Burton.